Many programming languages are founded on metaphors which tell a story about what computers do. One of the earliest stories is that a computer is a device for executing commands and that a program is nothing more than a series of such commands. This is the model that most people understand today and it is called the imperative programming model. The inset shows an imperative program written in pseudocode for adding together 10 and 12. It begins with a command to set x to 10 and y to 12. The program then enters a loop subtracting 1 from x and adding 1 to y. When x reaches 0, y is printed off. Notice that the equal sign used here is not the equal sign that mathematicians use. x equals x minus 1 is surely false if taken literally. What it means is that the area of memory associated with the variable x is to have its value decremented. x equals x minus 1 is not a statement. It is a command. Imperative programming stemmed in part from the work of the brilliant Cambridge mathematician Alan Turing. Alan Turing defined computation as a task which involved programming a pencil and paper creation, called later the Turing machine, which read input and executed instructions. The Turing machine scanned a length of tape and wrote symbols on the tape according to a series of pre-programmed instructions. Turing never actually built the Turing machine though an enthusiast did nearly 60 years after Turing's death. Turing's theoretical work on Turing machines in the 1930s and his work on the Colossus and later ACE influenced thinking about how computers should be programmed. But influential though he was, Turing's story was not the only metaphor in circulation. At the same time that Turing was working on the Turing machine, the American mathematician Alonzo Church was developing the idea that programs were fundamentally elements of a special class of functions. A function can be seen as a black box that receives a number of inputs and produces an output. Thus the addition function acts like a machine that receives 5 and 12 and outputs 17. However, not all functions are fit to be computed. The Shakespeare authorship question revolves around who wrote Shakespeare's plays. Was it Shakespeare or some of his contemporaries? Now there is, in mathematical terms, a function that for any play attributed to Shakespeare returns true if Shakespeare wrote it and false if he did not. But we cannot settle the Shakespeare authorship question by computer so some functions cannot be computed. What Church did was to define a notation, the lambda calculus, in which the Shakespeare authorship function could not be defined, but computable functions like addition could. Turing and Church defined computation in very different ways, but anything that could be computed in Turing's manner could be computed in Church's lambda calculus and vice versa. The Church-Turing thesis is that any feasible model of computation will prove equivalent in power to the models of Church and Turing. And though many models have been suggested since Turing and Church, the Church-Turing thesis has stood the test of time. Turing's model influenced imperative programming, but functional programming had to wait over 20 years before John McCarthy at MIT produced LISP, the first functional programming language. In functional programming, a program is a function which receives inputs and produces an output. Writing a program means defining a function, and executing the program means applying this function to the inputs to get an answer. LISP has always been a minority language, and yet it attracted some of the greatest minds in 20th century programming. Why is this? 
The answer lies in the elegance and power of functional programming, which allows us to define functions in a manner close to the way we would define them in maths. Lisp freed the programmer from having to consider the architecture of the computer. By allowing the programmer to define programs as functions and abstracting away from the need to consider allocating memory, Lisp left the programmer to free to work on the problems that interested him. To give an analogy, Lisp was transparent as regards the architecture of the machine on which it ran. Writing Lisp code was like looking at the problem through a clear window. But writing in an imperative language requires not only thinking about how to solve the problem, but also thinking about how to instruct the underlying machine to execute your solution. So looking at a problem through a procedural language is like looking at it through a stained or dirty window, or trying to see to the bottom of a pond in which there is a lot of surface glare and reflection. So the Lisp pioneers loved the power and the freedom of the language, and it became the premier language for artificial intelligence development. But the strength of Lisp was purchased at a high price. The structure of an imperative language is dictated by the architecture of the digital computer, which works by executing a series of commands and shifting data from one address to another. In a programming language which reflects the internal architecture of the computer, programs are likely to run quickly. In contrast, a language which ignores the architecture of the computer needs a very sophisticated compiler to relate the language to the machine. So functional programming acquired an immediate reputation for inefficiency that confined it to research labs for many years. But since Lisp attracted the most brilliant programmers and engineers of their generation, the Lisp machines were built to specifically run Lisp at high speed. They were architecturally designed to support functional programming. Lisp inside so many technologies, but it's worth mentioning the Lisp machines, even though they are no longer sold, because they predated the personal computer and introduced windowing and the mouse years before these features were found in high street computers. Another bonus of the functional approach was a scope for parallelizing computation. The imperative model lent itself to sequential execution. In Turing's model of computation, one instruction is executed and then another. But actually, functional expressions invite parallelism. In this equation, for example, we could compute the divisor and the numerator simultaneously and then divide one by the other. Thinking Machine's connection machine secured parallel computation for LISP. Available during the 1980s, the connection machine not only used parallelism of a scale not imagined with 64,000 processors, it was also one of the most iconic computers ever built, with an appearance right out of Arthur C. Clarke. These machines cost thousands of dollars and were found in prestigious research labs like MIT's AI Lab and SRI. Today, however, the situation is very different. Machines are thousands of times faster than they were in the 60s and 70s, and decades of compiler research has produced fast implementations of functional languages. In addition, multi-core machines for parallel programming can be purchased from your local computer shop, so you don't have to buy a special machine to do functional programming. Shen is a functional language, and this is the language we will use in this channel. Shen belongs to the Lisp family, and we'll see later what this means in detail, but it incorporates many features that were developed after Lisp was introduced. Shen was introduced in 2011, being created and designed in Britain and financed from Russia. It shares with few others the notable fact that it has been implemented in no less than 17 computer languages by programmers around the world. We will be using Shen for Windows under SBCL, and you could download this from the following URL.
I'll assume that you have downloaded Shen with the standard library already loaded and if you've started it and you have a window like this. When we run a program in a functional language we apply the defined function to the inputs and the computer computes the result. The environment in which this is done is called the read evaluate print loop or REPL because it operates as an infinite loop. The functional expression is read in, the result is evaluated and then it is printed off and the loop repeats. The prompt indicates that you are in the REPL. Let's begin by introducing the ensembler of objects with which we can play. Numbers are a class of self-evaluating objects in Shen. That means a number always evaluates it to itself. 12 evaluates to 12, 3 evaluates to 3. Let us look at a few different numbers. Floating points are also self-evaluating and E numbers are supported. When we define a function, we often use other functions to do it. In order to stop an infinite regress of defining functions in terms of functions in terms of functions, we have to suppose that there are certain functions we do not have to define, like addition. In functional programming languages, these are called system functions. They are built into the language and we do not have to define them. The arithmetic operations are system functions and you can find a list of system functions in the URL displayed here. We'll introduce these system functions as we go along in these lectures. In Shen, which is part of the Lisp family of functional languages, the function always goes before the inputs or arguments to the function. This is generally known as prefix notation and though it seems rather different from the mathematical convention of placing the addition sign between the arguments, it actually simplifies programming when we advance to higher levels to have a uniform convention for applying functions. We could also use symbols in Shen where a symbol is most generally a letter followed by letters or numbers with the option of dashes or underscores. The exact syntax can be found in the URL displayed here. Symbols are likewise self-evaluating. Two special cases are true and false, which are not treated as symbols in the usual sense, but are in the fact known as booleans, and we'll cover those in a later lecture. A final class of self-evaluating object is the class of strings. A string is created by placing any series of characters within quotation marks. Strings are a little more liberal than symbols. We can place a space in a string, but a space placed in a symbol creates two symbols. Now functions in Shen have types. The addition function can be applied to numbers, but not to symbols or strings. If we try to do this, we get an error, because a string is not the type of object to which addition can be applied. In statically typed functional languages, Errors like these are detected before an evaluation is made. If the types are wrong, the computer refuses to evaluate the expression. This involves inserting an extra step in the REPL. Instead of read, evaluate and print, we have read, type check and then, if the check is OK, evaluate and print. Most functional languages either enforce this check, like ML and Haskell, or omit it like Lisp. Shen makes the choice optional. When beginning functional programming it is useful to activate the type checker to check that the input is type secure. So we'll activate the type checker by entering TC plus and deactivate it by TC minus. We can check the types of various objects. We'll work largely within the type checker in the modules that follow. There is a useful facility for viewing our past inputs and repeating them without having to type in expressions again. 
all inputs are numbered and typing exclamation mark followed by a number n forces the evaluation of the nth expression typed to the REPL. We can also type exclamation mark followed by a symbol which looks for the expression headed by the characters in that symbol and repeats this expression. And double exclamation mark repeats the last input. Using percentage sign instead of exclamation mark simply prints off the expression without evaluating it. Well, that's enough for an introduction to the read evaluate print loop and the modus operandus of functional programming. In the next module, we'll look at how to define functions in Shen and how we can use this feature to define logic gates and logic circuits. Please subscribe if you enjoyed this video and consider donating to the Shen project through the URL given. See you in the next lecture.